watching, if you're out there watching live, we're glad to join in with us and become part of what we're doing. You're welcome. Just glad to have all of you with us tonight. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of, uh, of 1 John with me tonight, please. 1 John. 1 John, chapter number 1. And uh, we'll get into the scripture here, First John chapter 1. And verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we to you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Father, bless this word in the holy name. Amen. If any of the disciples qualified to speak to an issue like this, it certainly would be John the Apostle. For this same John the Apostle, folks, was with him when he was here in the flesh. Now, that's important because he had fellowship with him when he was here in the flesh. Scripture says that we no longer know him after the flesh. And, of course, the reason for that is because now he has been exalted and glorified. But he knew him after the flesh. So, therefore, he knew what it was to have fellowship with with the Father and with the Son. That's important because what he's telling you here in the book of 1 John is that you can have that fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And so therefore, the Father, the Son, by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Now, when you deal with people today, I'm going to talk to you tonight on a very practical level. You talk to a lot of people about their their relationship with the Lord and their Christian life, and they'll say, well, you know, I'm following my my heart, I, if I know my heart, I'm doing this and that, and uh, you know, I'm, I have my mind, I renew my mind daily, read the Bible, and I pray, and so everything should be okay because I'm trusting in my mind and in my heart. They don't say it that way, but that's exactly what they're saying. You see, you, you hear very few people telling you that they trust in their communion with God to walk with the Lord and live for the Lord. You'll never get any closer to God on this earth than communion. Communion is a very powerful thing. Now what you'd notice in 1 John, in chapter number 1, you have what's going on inside the mind and the heart and the soul of the believer in communion with God. We have fellowship. We walk in the light as he is in the light. This is what 1 John chapter number 1 is about. Then when the deed is committed, you go to chapter number 2, and who shows up? Satan. Notice carefully. Satan shows up in chapter 2. Notice carefully. He's not in chapter 1. That's important. What I just gave you was one of the profound keys to understanding the lesson tonight. Satan is not in chapter number 1 in the heart and in the mind. And say, why not? Well, Satan's not God. And there's only one who can read the heart and the mind. If you have your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12, and here's what it says. Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 12. It says, the word of God is quick, it's alive, it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow. Now this, of course, lays out the structure of a man and is a discerner of what? The thoughts and intents of the heart. You see this? The word of God can read your heart. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Satan can read your heart. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Satan can read your mind. Put that in the back of your mind and think about that before we go further. In the book of Psalm chapter 139 and verse 23, the scripture says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart, Try me and know my thoughts. Therefore, the word of God can read your heart. And God can read your heart. 
God can read your mind and he can read your heart. What goes through the mind originates in the heart. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, not with the mind. The mind is the playground or the working ground or the buffer zone between the saved soul and the flesh. You can have an earthly, carnal mind or you can have a spiritual, godly mind, holy mind. Now, in the book of Romans 8, I want you to look at this with me tonight. I'm going to approach something that I've never approached it in this manner before. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 26. Romans 8, 26. Likewise the Spirit, and my Bible is capitalized, also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. Now look carefully at what you're reading. With groanings, which cannot be what? They're not made audible. In plain words, Satan cannot read your mind. Satan cannot read your heart, but he can hear what you say. This is what's going on here. That's one part of it, one approach to it, but he can certainly hear what you say. You say, why is that important? Because he can speak too. And he can speak into your mind, into your heart. He can speak. He's a spirit being. He's limited in his power, and God intended to limit Satan because he wanted to give you a way where you could commune with God in total freedom, where nothing could interfere with your communion with God. Why? Because your communion with God is the most important thing in your spiritual life. So can Satan read your mind? That's a question. You ought to type that in, go on the internet with it. And you'd be surprised at what you'll hear. Well, let me give you a couple of practical things that will make you think about this. For example, when King Herod wanted to know about the birth of Christ, do you remember that? He asked the Magi, the wise men that came from the east. He asked them, and uh, they, of course, said, uh, we'll go find where he is, and the star led them there. But you see, Satan could not read their mind. He couldn't do it. He couldn't read their mind. He couldn't read their heart. God had protected them. And it's important to understand, for example, baby Moses. When Moses was a baby, you remember they, they lied to Caesar? You remember that one? Caesar wanted to kill the firstborn of the male children. And they said, well, you know, the Hebrews are, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They're very lively. They have them so fast that we can't do anything about it. And babies go, the baby's born and gone. Well, that was a lie. But God used that. You see, he used it. Well, here we have, we have Satan was unable to go into a spiritual uh, realm to where he could read and cut off or go ahead or do anything of that nature. He was limited as to what he could do because Satan cannot read your mind and he can't read your heart but he can hear what it says and he can watch how, how you live he can see how you live your life and Satan is very good at that so in the book of Romans chapter number 8 when we come to prayer this is important Satan is cut out of this because we have groanings which aren't even uttered these are deep spiritual moans unto the Lord God. And Satan can't hear it. And you say, well, then why is that important? I'll get into it in a moment and show you why it is important. Do you remember Hannah? Do you remember Hannah when she prayed? You remember the Bible says that her lips were moving, but uh, Eli, he heard no sound. He thought she was drunk. See? And I mean, you talk about a great spiritual discerner. It was Eli. You remember he was the daddy of Hophni and Phoenix. <laughs> Yeah, no, no kidding, and you know what they did. And that's where Ichabod wound up. But uh, Eli, of course, said, well, you're drunk. And she said, oh, no, 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 I'm not drunk. She said, I'm speaking from the depths of my soul. All right. Here is Hannah praying a very powerful prayer, but no words came out of her mouth. 
You see, somebody told you that the only prayer that God will hear is the ones that you vocalize, that you speak audibly. And there you do pray audible prayers. I'm certainly not against that tonight in any sense of the word. But I'm trying to show you where a battlefield rages. I want to show you where there's something necessary for you to learn that will have a It'll have a great benefit in your, uh, in your communion with God. How many of you want communion with God? I want a communion with him. I really do. I, I really do. I really do. I want to commune with God. I've got a hole I crawl into. I shut the door and I get down on my hands and my knees. And I pray. I talk to God. I talk to God. And God showed me something the other day as I was praying to him. And I thought, now why didn't I see this before in the same way? talked about it words that cannot be uttered Satan does not know what's going on if it's not audible can you pray to God without saying audible words yes you can as a fact of the matter is you can speak to God from the depths of your soul and Satan can't read that now, I'll show you why it's important. I was down praying the other day, and I started hearing something, and I was talking to God. And then I started questioning him. I said, now, Lord, you're not going to get mad if I try the spirits. No, nope. he said, I won't get mad. I said, because I don't know if it's you talking to me or if it's the devil. That's what I said to him. I don't know if it's just my mind fantasizing and flying away. Am I the only one that has problems like that? When you pray, do your, does your mind ever drift? When you pray, do you ever hear words and you wonder where they come from? When you pray, are you certain it's God speaking to you? Or could it be a spirit being speaking to you? You're not certain. So how do you do it? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you discern? That's important. That's a big deal. And I want to give you part of it tonight. But to be able to discern spirits is a very valuable thing, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I think it is. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 12, if you will remember, Elijah went to the top of that mountain. We had wind and we had fire and we had all of that. But how did God speak to Elijah? A still, small voice. Now, how many of you know what I'm talking about when I say still, small voice? Okay? All right. A still, small voice. So in my prayer closet, I said to myself, now it's either me talking to me, it's either my mind, talking to me or it is a spirit a demon talking to me or the devil talking to me and God said now son how are you talking to me now listen carefully to me tonight uh, if you had been standing outside my prayer closet you would not have heard a thing I'd been in prayer for 15 20 minutes or however long I was in it you would not have heard a thing nothing but I was praying I was praying, believe me, I was praying. From the depths of my soul, I was praying. He said, now son, say something to me. And so I asked him a question. Got real quiet, got real quiet. Then he gave me an answer. Then he said, where do you think that came from? I said, it must have come from you, Lord. He said, it had to, because Satan didn't hear that. You see, if Satan hears you talking audibly, he can put all kinds of confusion in your head. Are you following me? He hears an audible thing, then he can come in confusion, and confusion is one of his greatest weapons. You don't know what to believe. You don't know where this is coming from. Who's talking to me? You know, God, is this your will for me to do this and that? And here it comes, here, this, 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 this. You don't know what to do, right? But if you get down on your knees and shut the door and get alone with God and don't say an audible word at all, just your heart, and he reads the heart, then you know who's hearing you. Now, you may still hear some voices. You may still hear some spirits that intervene because they know what you're trying to do, but they don't know what you're saying. How many get that? They don't know what you're saying. God does. And after a while down on your knees, in your prayer closet, door shut. You continue to commune with God. You're communing with him. I got on the internet and I thought, let me see what the definition of communion, let's see what some of them have to say about communion. Uh, what is, you know, koinonia is the word 
in, in 1 John 1. It's translated a number of different ways in the New Testament, but the way it's translated here is commune. So what is communion? What is the essence of communion? Don't you like to get answers like that? Somebody said one time, say, what is prayer? A fellow said, well, it's just asking and receiving. Do you think that's all prayer is? Don't you think it goes deeper than that? Don't you think it goes much deeper than simply asking and receiving? Well, of course it does. Asking and receiving has nothing to do with communion. Communion, one definition is this. Prayer is spiritual communication between man and God. Now watch this. Two-way relationship in which man not only talks to God, but listens to him. You hear that? Now, how many of you have heard preachers say that God doesn't talk to people today? And this is all over the internet. This is from one of the most famous evangelists that ever lived in this country. And that's what he says. He says, you listen to God. All right? Here's another one. At its simplest, prayer is communion with God. So what is prayer? It's communion with God. How can I commune with God? Well, if you're an unsaved man, you cannot. You can pray as an unsaved man, but you're not going to commune with God. Why? Because you're not qualified. You have to have the Holy Ghost. Your spirit has to be born again. And once that spirit is born again, you enter into a profound spiritual relationship and connection that can only be reached by prayer. Prayer is one of the most profound things that God gives us on this earth. Prayer, if you are truly born of the Spirit of God, you can pray. You can commune with God. You can commune from your heart to Him, and He will speak back to your heart. And there is nothing on this earth like that. Now, you've got, to have, you've got to have maturity. You've got to be able to understand what I'm saying tonight. You have to try the spirits. But once you've been at it a while, and whatever spirit may be trying to run something through your mind to try to confuse you, and you start asking God questions, and that spirit cannot answer them. Did you hear what it said? Because that spirit does not know the question you ask. Because the spirit cannot read your mind or your heart but he answers that question and speaks back into your spirit and your soul what do you have when that happens communion so I did that I said Lord all right let me try this let me try these spirits because you wouldn't believe how many times I've been in my prayer closet I'd be down praying talking to the Lord and, have, and I had a good prayer, and some thing come in there, and I'd stop praying, and I'd say, you ungodly, filthy demon in the name of Jesus, get out of my prayer room. Stop what I'm doing and confront that thing. And most of the time, it'd leave right then. It'd be gone. But then I, here I am, I'm left to go back into my prayer with the Lord again, you see. If you can find a place to where you know how to commune with God, and get past any type of interference and confusion that Satan tries to throw in your way, now you are getting into the true essence of prayer. If it's real prayer, it's real communion. You see what I mean? He's talking to you, you're talking to him. And you have tried the spirits, and you know that he's the only one that can read the question that's in your heart they don't even know what it is. They can't answer it. You've put them on the spot. They can't cross that line. Oh, they can still speak and try to confuse you, but ask God a question and see if they can answer it. They don't even know what it is. How I many of you follow me here tonight? Are you getting, are you getting a hold of any, any of what I'm trying to say? Yeah. They don't know. They don't know. There's no demon in hell that can read my heart right now. But this Bible can and God can. But they can't do it. But they'll sure try. They'll try to confuse you and they'll run their, they'll run their course. So 
Sometimes when I get down to pray, I don't say, I don't even speak to God from my heart for a few minutes. I just get down. I just get down. I get down and try to clear my soul. Try to clear my soul. You know, a lot of times you, you get, day feels full of, you get all kinds of stuff you're doing, you're reading and this and that and this and that and this and that. And you want to clear as much of that out of your heart as you can. You want to focus your mind on the Lord. You want to talk to God. You want to commune with him. There's nothing, my dear Christian friend, God bless your soul tonight, that if you're truly born again, that will encourage you and bless you and strengthen you like a communication from the Father to your soul where you know he's heard you and he's speaking back to you. Nothing. There's nothing that can take the place of that. And that's your heritage. That's yours. Satan can't take that away from you. That belongs to you. So, prayer is communion with God. This is why you've heard me say, and I'm sure I get a lot of criticism for saying it, but there's not a word in that Bible that says, a, that, says that an angel has the Holy Spirit, is there? No. There's not a word in that Bible that says an angel can commune with God. Not one word. There's not a word in that Bible that says an angel anywhere prays. You see, you're made in the image of God. And there's something about you that rises above the angel. I know Hebrews 2 says you've been made a little lower than the angels, but you're not going to stay there. You're going to be elevated above. The day will come when you will judge angels. Oh yeah, that day is going to come because you've been made in the image of God. God made you a creature, a being that is capable of reaching in to a place in the heart of God that nothing else can. Do I need to say that again? God made you as a being, a creature that is capable through communion to reach into the heart of God into a place that nothing else can. And you can receive from the heart of God communication to you into your heart that nothing else can. Now, if you don't pray, I'm sure you, <laughs> you're probably squirming a little bit tonight, a little uncomfortable. And Satan will fight your prayer life more than anything. He really will. He'll fight it. And the reason he fights it is because he knows that if he can keep you out of the prayer closet, then he'll, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll drain you of your power. Now, <clears throat> there are people who can quote vast portions of the Bible. There are people who have dedicated their lives to studying the scriptures. And they are, in every sense of the word, what you would call, uh, you know, a, a, a student of the Bible that's capable, fully capable to teach it. But without communion with God, and I'll make a statement tonight and I'll live by it and die by it. Without communion with God, you can fill yourself from cover to cover with that book right there and you'll never know the power of God and you'll never know joy and you'll be puffed up and heady and high-minded for the rest of your life. You will. You'll never know what humility is and you'll never know the power of God. Now, I'm not saying don't study it. If you can memorize every word in the Bible, do it. I'm not against studying the Bible. But that alone will not give you the communion I'm talking about. Most people, most people give up on their prayer life because they just, they get bored. They, you know, they go in there and they say a bunch of words, you know, that sometimes are given a list to pray for. And there's nothing wrong with praying for people's things that they ask you, list of names and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. But the only thing that's going to pump life into your soul is communion with God. And in order to have that communion with God, you're going to have to be able to discern spirits. Now this leads us into a further thing, but I'm not going to get into it tonight because it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a heavy-duty stuff. We'll learn Hebrews chapter number 12. The Bible says he scourges every son that he receives. He chastens us because he loves us. Chastisement is remedial, not necessarily a punitive punishment. Uh, it could be the one, but most of the time it's remedial. It's to teach you. It's to instruct you. And, uh, and, and he does that. He instructs us. And we learn through these things. But he also says uh, in dealing with chastisement, don't look down upon it. And don't just pass it off. If something happens in your life, don't just kick it off and say, well, it happens to everybody. All alike. And that just push, puts everybody together as if to say, God is not trying to speak to you. 
and get your attention. The best thing for you to do and for me or anyone else to do is to watch the circumstances of our lives and when something happens in our lives, take it to the Lord. Take it to God and talk to Him about it. Now, does that bring us back to communion? See what I mean? See how they complement each other? Certainly it does. If something happens, you don't have an answer for it. God may not give you a direct answer, but He'll let you know He heard you. You take it to the Lord, and if He's dealing with an issue in your life or He wants to, he wants to teach you something or guide you some way, chastisement comes in a lot of ways. Folks, every one of you are going to be chastised, including this preacher right here in this pulpit. And the Bible says he scourges every son that he receives. And, uh, you know, this is part of it. But don't you understand the practicality of what I'm trying to say to you tonight? This is how you live your life as a Christian. If you cannot communicate with the God that you serve, the one you say you love, the one, who, the one that you say you believe in, if you're not communicating with him, how do you know what's going on in your life? You don't have a clue. How many understand what I'm saying? you agree with that? Of course. So what I'm giving you is the foundational, rudimentary aspect of what it means to live a Christian life. And basic number one, at the foundation of all of it, is to be able to commune with God. That's how you live the Christian life. That's how you do it. And so, I think it, uh, this... <laughs> I think that probably the essence of prayer, the very essence of it, is communion. It's not so much the words. What's John's, or what's, what's the Apostle Paul talking about in Romans 8? Do you think he's concerned so much about your words? You remember what he said to you? You know not what you ought to pray for as you ought, right? Okay, exactly. So what do you do? It means that you get down and, and yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and let him begin to move in your heart. And you'd be amazed at how in a prayer closet he begins to take you in directions you didn't even know and deal with issues in your life that you, you were totally blind to. But he'll deal with it as with a father dealing with a son. And that's a wonderful thing. I've got a heavenly father who loves me. And if God be for me, then who can be against me? And he's for me. And he's for you. He's for every one of us. So when you go home tonight, just think about what I've said. I don't know what time of the day you set aside to pray. Everybody has their own time. Uh, you know, I, I have my time. I, I've got more than one time. I've got one time I go in the closet, but that's not the only time I pray. <laughs> Good night. But I have my closet time. And... Uh, Everybody in their, own, in their own way, in your own life, the way your schedule goes and the way you do things. That's up to you. I'm not here tonight to tell you when to do things. I don't like micromanaging the lives of people. I'm only part of that. But I do want you to pray, folks. Temple Baptist Church hasn't even seen what God's able to do with this place. If you get people in here that start praying and really want to know what God wants to do with their lives, what does he want for your life? Well, you're not going to get it from a book. There are good books, plenty of good books, plenty of good ideas. I'm not against all of that. Good night. But that's not where it's going to come from. It's going to come from communion with God. And there's no substitute for it. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time we've had together in your house tonight. Thank you, Lord. You've been better to me than I ever deserved. Lord, have mercy. Better than I ever deserved. You've been good to me. You've been good to me. You've been good to me in your holy name. In thy holy, holy, holy name, I pray. Heads are bowed tonight. Would anybody raise your hand? And this is done in, in you know, in privacy. Nobody's looking. Say, Preacher Lawson, I've tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed to get a prayer life going. I'll go for a while, then I'll, then I'll, you know, something will happen or I'll get bored or whatever. But would you pray for me tonight, preacher, that I can get started again and I can have a prayer life. God bless you. Amen. God bless every one of you. God bless every one of you. Amen. Father, bless them now. Bless the ones who raise their hands. Bless them, Father. Let the sweet Holy Ghost.
come into their soul and help them, Lord. Help them. Help them, Father. Lord, help them. Speak spiritual truths into their heart and bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's all I've got, folks. I want you to, I want you to have communion with the Lord.